And then you add this thing, filling up for Jake today. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So um, I'm going to share my screen as well and get ready. Um, it's 8.01, so we have, let's see, do we have anybody new today? Looks like everybody's been here before. So we skipped the intro and um, the way Jake wanted us to do this was for the first, um, for the first part of this, we go through um, Greg's presentation from last time and I'll do my best to answer any questions and please jump in at any point um, if you have any comments and for the for the later part we uh, um, we proceed with um, Daniel's presentation of um, category theory so let me share my screen please All right, hopefully everyone can can see my screen. Yep, we can. Yes. Cool. Um, so I took a screenshot of um, um, Greg's presentation for, for this um, new calculus. And this was uh, the exercise that we, um, or the presentation that we were going through. Um, anybody has any questions on that? Um, um, anybody has any comments then we could start talking about this? All right. Uh, yeah, Kevin, I guess I struggled with location update a little bit. Location updates. I see that it's defined down below, like at the bottom of your screenshot. I didn't know if there was like a real quick... I guess, so I see... Yeah, I'm not really sure how to read you, I guess, is what I'm saying. You for location update. Right. So um, let me bring my notes, please. There we go. Uh, can we say that uh, U is like a zero, or like a, another mm. s something like variable in, in lambda calculus? Or So, um, yeah, the way the way the way I understood this, um, and again, I could be totally um, help help me out here if I'm if I'm going off track here. But the way I understood it is that we're introducing introducing context as as part of the name and. And as this context changes, then this this that that kind of represents this this U, the location update. Um, um, maybe if we go through the exercise that Greg had, that 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 might help. Okay. So let me um, bring my next slide. So I just um, took a picture of uh, basically his presentation and I tried to make my notes. Um, um, if you don't mind, we could walk through this and then try to explain what you is in terms of that exercise. Um, yeah. Would that work? Yeah, that sounds great. And I, I don't want to derail your whole thing too. So if, if you didn't want to spend much time on that, that's okay. No, no, please jump in. Um, so to give you a little context, no pun intended, um, I usually listen to Greg's presentation and then I rely on Jake to explain it to me. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in the same predicament as, as you are. Cool. But, but going through this, so we have a four comprehension and um, um, so, um, so basically uh, we're trying to send um, send this uh, process this process p on on some name and in this case this is the simplest name which is kind of like the zero process the 
the, the zero name with, with row calculus. It's, it's a whole and a zero process. And at the same time, we're, we're putting this K prime context and, and the combination of these two is being passed through this four comprehension. And if I understood Greg correctly, um, once all that substitution is completed and the process runs, we're just dropping, dropping the K and the Q. Okay. So, so to answer your, your question, I think, I think as we do the semantic substitution, um, that location or that context gets, gets updated. And that's what this last part is. And, Got it. Um, and again, I welcome any comment. That was the way I understood it. So if, if anybody has a different understanding, do jump in, please. Cool. Um, does anyone have any questions, any, any comments in that regard? Okay, let me go back to the previous one. Um, so one thing that helped me to, to, to get an intuition for this context was um, the way Greg um, used the JVM analogy. That if we could think of this context as, um, as the resources that are, that are as the resources that are that are in the environment, and once those those resources are, are provided, then then the computation could proceed. So it could be um, it could be the number of threads that are available, or it could be um, it doesn't necessarily have to be have to be JVM or thread. It could be something that's waiting for let's say a data database connection that once that database connection occurs, then the, then the process could continue. That helped me to, to wrap my mind around this, this new context. Um, what do you guys think? Does that sound reasonable? What do you guys think? Does that sound reasonable? Makes sense. All right. Um, so let me quickly um, look at my notes. And um, so again, this this part um, is just what we what we what we just discussed. Um, going through Greg's presentation, and all right. And then the second part of his um, exercise was was basically again this part that we went through. And I think one thing that Greg mentioned was. Um, that this, this com or this context could be something that, that's nonlinear, meaning that it generates the next context. So in that case, uh, what he was talking about that, that this K prime P, the process P could, could continue, uh, you know, it runs in this context and then creates a new context or a new environment and then it runs in the new environment. So P could keep on moving into that space. And again, that intuitively made sense to me because um, you, could have, you could have an environment and a process that trigger the next event and the next process and you could have all these triggering events continue in a streaming fashion. Um, all right, so if no questions there, um, I think the next part of his, his presentation, Greg's presentation on calculus was introducing this um, to the location update, introducing a name. And um, quite frankly, I listened to that part of presentation a couple of times, but I didn't, I didn't understand it enough to be able to um, to make a presentation. Um, it definitely, it, it, it resonated and it made sense to me, but I didn't quite get it 
in a way that I can that I can describe it to this group. If anybody had a different understanding or a better understanding, please do jump in. I have a question about this, uh, uh, the last rule, when, when uh, U is used. Can okay. Something about that? Yeah, so that's, that's what I was saying. My, the way I, um, from, his, from Greg's lecture, the way, the way I understood is that by, by providing a name, now the location update, um, you, you could have like, a, like an execution trace that you provide a name and then you could take snapshots of, of how these location updates are occurring. So you're not you're not losing it. You could you could you could you could hang on to them, um, kind of like um, you know like um, you know like high in a, in a kind of like a monadic computation. You could you could have side effects and you could pass on pass that side effect to to the next to the next instruction or to the next computation. That's the way I understood what this um, uh, introducing the name into location update was. That that you could you could pass this these locations to the next context. And so you could have a you could have a trace of them. Um, does that okay, that makes sense, yeah thanks. It good. And again, please, what I what what I say, take with a grain of salt, because um, I'm not that versed in this in this subject. Um, what I'm telling you is, after listening to Greg's uh, lecture three four times this morning, and try to to come um, to have a better explanation. Cool. Um, what questions you might have? Anybody have? Anybody else has any comments? Cool. Is there something else that any you folks would like to talk about before uh, we move on to category theory? All right. Do you do you have a a sense for? And I missed the beginning, so I came late. But maybe shortly you could tell us your high level intuition on. Um, where rho lang in space or rho calculus in space takes us the implications uh like kenny asked me once like the so what like what's the larger purpose of it and, and maybe you already mentioned it but that would be interesting to me okay um are we talking in terms of the last lecture um is that is that what your question scope is or the future of the R chain project or distributed computing or quantum computing, whatever, wherever you want to go. Yeah. So, um, this is, this is a very valid question, but for the purpose of this discussion, again, since my background is somewhat limited at this too, I really like to keep, um, keep it at, at, at the lecture and what we were discussing. Um, those are a little bit larger question for me to answer anyway. Um, I think to, to get a better response, definitely a more um, educated response on that. We need to either get Jake in here or rely on, rely on Greg. Having said that, if Anybody in the group would like to jump in and answer that question? I definitely welcome it. But I think it's a little bit larger question than, than I could answer you in a way that I could um, that I could give you a um, good enough presentation. Does anybody want to jump in and answer that question? Thanks for going over last week's lecture again. Oh, no problem. No problem. Um, all right, 
having so let me i think i did stop sharing daniel if you like to take on with the um, with the category presentation we're at your disposal hi uh all right thanks i guess let me just sh share my screen and get things set up here uh, all right this oops um, where am I going here Look of her. where the heck is the presentation mode here we go okay so can everyone hear me yeah but we don't see your yeah, setting oh you don't okay let me Oh, I didn't click. Okay. How's that? Yep, got it. Yep, see it. Great. Um, so here's where we ended up last time <clears throat> and where we said we wanted to go. So I want to show that every Levere theory has project maps. And then. Daniel, we're looking at your email right now. I don't know if that's what. Oh, you are? Uh, yeah, this is the Jake's invitation for today's lesson, is what we see. Oh, that's weird. I see my presentation. Uh, uh, I don't know if you, maybe you shared a window instead of the whole desktop or something. I'm not, I don't know. Oh, maybe. I think you're right. Let me try this again. Share desktop, share that. How's that? Yep, perfect. Great. Great. Um, okay, so uh where we want to go from here this is where we wound up last time uh so i want to say how first of all every levere theory has these projection maps and i'll again remind us what these things mean and then i want to cover the um, an example of a monoid and how you can capture a monoid using levere theories and i'll also explain what a, a monoid is and then models of levere theories and monads uh we'll have to probably put off to another time just because I don't think we'll have enough time in, for in one day. But again, I think the motivation that Jake has for learning this stuff is that after monads, we can talk about distributive laws, which is basically, in short, a way to... So a monad is a type of function, a special type of function. Uh, so of course, a function happens sort of in time, if you can think of it, like it goes from one place to another. Uh, so if you do one, apply one function and then another function, uh, you have to be able, in order to be able to switch the order in which you do them, that's what's called a distributive law in monads. And I guess their idea is that you can capture some sort of logic using these distributive laws. Um, but that'll take a little while to get to. Um, so just to remind you of, of, few of the definitions that we had last time, we talked about a category, which is a collection of things that we just call objects. And these objects can be anything, right? An object is a primitive notion. So it's just like a collection of dots of some sort. Uh, and usually we give name to the dot to be able to distinguish one dot from another. Uh, and also another primitive notion is this collection of arrows. And an arrow goes from one object to another. And of course, the most important thing is that we can compose arrows to get a new arrow. So that if we have an, an arrow F from X to Y and another arrow G from Y to Z, then we can compose those two to get the arrow F compose Y from X to Z. And that's basically like composition in, I guess if you took calculus and you learned composition there. It's basically an abstraction of that. Okay, so that's a category. And then a product of types. So again, you can replace the word types with an object in a category or with the word set. I figured I'd just stick with types. Um, so a product of this list of types, uh, X not through XN, is a new type, which we denote you know, x0 cross x1 cross x2 and so on and so on all the way up to xn. 
And so we can think of this new type as consisting of these tuples where each, uh, each factor in the tuple belongs to the, like the kth factor in the tuple belongs to the kth thing in the, sorry, it would belong to XK. And then the way that we can access this information, because in category theory, we can't, we're not allowed to look inside these types or these objects. So we have to access them, access the information that these project, that these objects have externally. So we do that is with these projection maps. So a projection map just is a map uh, from the type X naught, cross X1, cross X2, and so on, down to XK. And we get one of these for K is equal to zero and one all the way through N. So the idea is that these sort of return the Kth, uh, the Kth element in our tuple. And that's how we access the sort of stuff Can that's- Can I jump in with a question, Danny? Oh, I'm sorry? Can I jump in with a question? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm thinking of like, so I've got this N tuple here and I, for whatever reason, I want to know like, what's the third element in this N tuple, mm -hmm. but I'm not allowed to do, I'm not allowed to do like subscripting or like put square brackets three or whatever, like I might with an array or something. But luckily mm -hmm. I have this projection map that projects the whole N tuple down into, I guess the space of like X three, whatever that type is. And so that gives me the third element from my N tuple. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and then another question for you. When when I I'm just barely looking at ladle, but mm -hmm. they talk about this concept of sorts. Is that the same thing as what you're calling types here, or are those different? Um, so I think so. Unfortunately, there's like only so many words like type, sort, kind, where we're trying to talk about things that fall into a certain category. Yeah. Well, I mean, category more colloquially here, and not as a mathematical object. Uh huh. Um, so I think he's using the word sort to sort of mean synonym for the word type, but not, necessar not necessarily, but also try to remove it from the word type as a computer scientist might use okay. it. Okay, all right, roger that. Thanks a lot. Sure. Uh, I also have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, is this a product type for like a, the same object as base object which doesn't have any which which you don't have which you cannot uh, get any information from, from this like base object i'm sorry could you repeat the question uh this product type is also uh, like an object in the category yes yes but is it different from the from the smallest object that you cannot uh, uh, ask anything from them or without projection maps or, or is uh -huh. it the same I'm thinking uh, using the projection map to to get something. Uh, is there any consequences uh, of, the, of this? Um, so let's see. There are consequences in the sense that whenever you have finite products, these projection maps come automatically because they're actually part of the structure of the product. And so once you have these projection maps, they'll be able to interact with all of your other maps in your category that might be there that might have nothing, or sorry, arrows. Um, they'll interact with other arrows that might have nothing to do with products. So I don't know if, th if that answers your question. Um, maybe, maybe later you, uh, you'll cover this. So okay, you. yeah, sorry. Um, okay, so we have this product of types, we have a category, and so usually we think of like, so when we take a product, we usually do it inside a category. So these types will actually be objects in our category. And then these projection maps will be arrows in that category. Um, okay. And then the next thing that's important for us that we covered last time is this idea of an n -ary operation. So if we take a type X, an n -ary operation is just like a function from the n-fold product of x to x itself. And so the way to think about this is that it inputs an n-tuple where every th single element in that n-tuple is gonna be from x, and then it's gonna take those and combine them somehow and just return a single object of x. 
So it need not be a projection map. It can be, but it need not be. Um, so the classic example is if we're working with type real numbers, say, um, then we can have a binary operation that just takes two real numbers and adds them together to get a new real number, right? Or multiplication, right? That's another option. Um, so that's the idea of an binary operation. And again, we can put all of this in the context of a category where these types, instead of being types, they'll actually be objects of some category. And this function will actually be an arrow inside of that category. Okay. Um, so are there any questions about these three concepts? So the NRA operation could be one of your projection maps, right? But it doesn't have to be. Yeah, exactly. It could be anything of that form. And so a projection map is of that form. So that's a, certainly a possibility. But it, like you said, it need not be uh, a projection map. And uh, when we have a pro product category, is this category of any product size or, or specific finite? Um, Can you mix the different sizes in one category? Yes. Yes. Of course. Okay. You can. Uh, yeah, you can definitely mix different sizes. And actually, once you have, uh, if you if you have a category, and we know that that category has all binary products. That is, you can multiply any two objects in your category to get a new object. Then that means we can multiply any finite number because you can always sort of, if you want to say multiply, you can always kind of do it associatively, like one step at a time, right? You can like multiply two things together and then you get a new type and then you can take that new type and multiply it by another thing. So that's like yeah, that, a threefold product. Yeah, that's my question for uh, energy operation. Uh, is this in a sense like a binary operation that you can do it multiple times, as you said, Oh, yes. Um, right. So given a binary operation, that, of, that sort of generates operations of higher arity. But we're not guaranteed that these things are associative, right? Uh, that's a good question. Usually we think of them as being associative. So I'm sort of like waving certain things okay. under the, um, on, I'm sort of sweeping some things under the rug. But when you say unary operation, we're assuming, yes, that it sort of doesn't matter what, like, it, we assume everything's sort of happening at once. Okay. And, so, and there's other ways of encoding doing things in different orders. See. So Which, this unary operation could be something like a, like a reduce? And in a way that the order of how you compute individual elements to come up with a reduction is not necessarily important. Um, no, not usually. And usually we do have, we'll have equations inside of our category that tell us that this is true. Um, so the thing is, so maybe if, uh, if we have, a binary operation and another binary operation, we could sort of combine them together to get a three area operation. For instance, uh, let's just take the binary operation of addition. And we can, we can take that and the binary operation of addition and combine them together to get the three area operation where we take any three numbers and just take their sum. And usually when we think of it as a three area operation, we think of it as the addition all happening simultaneously. But we can also sort of break it up into smaller pieces and say, all right, so we're going to add the first two together. Sorry. So if we think of a three area operation, then we'll take a, a tuple of three, one, two, three numbers, then add them together. We can think of adding the first two together and doing nothing to the third, and then adding that result with the third thing in our tuple, 
or we could do it the other way around. We could have the first number in our tuple do nothing, and it'll add the second two together. So that'll give us two numbers in which we can add those two. And then usually to say a, uh, that addition is associative, we'll look at it that way by either adding the first two things first or the second two things first. And we'll have an equation inside of our category to really say that it's associative. I don't know, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll see an example of this too. Um, so just a few more recollections. So a Levere theory is this category. So the objects of this category are generated by taking all finite products of a single primitive object. And we'll just call it primitive thing X, right? It, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, and it doesn't, it's not, doesn't need to be anything that you're familiar with. It's just an abstract concept really. Um, so, what does that mean to taking all finite products of a single primitive object X? Well, it means we're going to take the null array product, which means a product of no copies of X, which is what we call one. Right, and the fact that that's one is analogous to when we raise uh, in raise a number to the zeroth power. Right, is if you have like the number two raised to the zeroth power is equal to one. Uh, that's because we're multiplying like zero copies of two. So this the fact that the nullary product is one is sort of uh, an abstraction of that idea. And if we take the unary product of X, which is just X, and the binary product of X, which is X times X, which we often uh, denote using the shorthand X squared. And we can do this for any number of copies of X we want. So we can take the n fold product for any number n, for any integer n. Sorry, not integer, positive integer. Okay, so those are the objects of this category of any okay. living. I've got a question for you, Daniel. So mm -hmm. imagine I choose some X and I and I make a Levere theory. So I've taken all of these finite products of X and, mm -hmm. and the nullary product, this one is is in there. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. So I've got this Levere theory, I set it aside. Now I choose a new X and I do the same exact thing. And mm -hmm. uh, when I look at my two Levere theories side by side, is that one are those like the same or are they equal in some sense? Does that question even make sense? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so if you have two separate Levere theories, we can't really talk about something in one category being equal to something in another category because they're in two different categories. So they don't talk to each other. So the only way we can really get the two categories to talk to each other is if there's what's called a functor between them. And a functor is uh, the categorical notion of a function Okay. Uh, on categories. So we would need to have this functor from one Levere theory to the other. And then we can talk about how two objects are relating to each other, whether or not they're equal or there's different notions of equality in. Yep. Got it. Okay. okay. Okay, that's cool. And so is the functor is the functor one directional? Like, is it is it guaranteed to be like one to one or, you know, something like that? Or so thinking about like mapping sets onto one another. Is there a, is the functor kind of similar there? Or? Um, so let's see. So to s answer that question in the most broad context. There's really the only thing a functor needs to do is preserve composition. So it's like you can, so if you have a functor between two categories, this might actually be helpful if I use my hands a little bit. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and maybe. Um, so I'm going to draw something on paper. Sure. Yeah. So let's say we have a. Yep, functor it. and C and D are just two arbitrary categories. So they need not be Levere theories. So there's really not many rules that this functor has to satisfy to be called a functor. The only thing it has to do is be able to, let's see, if we have an arrow, so A, C. So let's say we have these two arrows 
in C. And they go, so they, the one picks up where the other one left off. So we're able to compose them to get a new arrow. Yep. And this so, is all in category C, right? Yes. So this information is going to be picked up by our functor and brought over to D. And so if I give the functor a name, I'll just call it capital F, then what's going to happen is we're going to get these, basically that same information that we started with in C, but it's going to be brought over to the category in D. And we'll just denote those things. Um, so the object A and C gets brought over to some object F of A in D, the object B, which is in C, gets brought over to some object F of B, and same with C. And also these arrows get brought over by F to, so since the arrow F goes from, let me see. Yeah, so the arrow F goes from A to B, that means the functor is gonna take the arrow F to an arrow between F of A and F of B. Got it. Okay, so, so the functor maps not only the objects, but also the arrows. Yes, exactly. Okay. And so what it does is it preserves composition because okay. really we also have... Um, and uh, this is also called natural transformation, right? Um, so the natural transformation is a sort of level of abstraction oh. in a sense, but functors are involved in natural transformations. Yeah, absolutely. So that's sort of like what a functor does. And then once everything is over in one category, we can talk about things and see how they're related to things in D. But that's only with relation to this functor. There could be a whole different functor that brings things in C over to D in a very different way. But they both have to preserve composition. They both have to preserve composition, exactly. Okay, so my question about is the nullary result, is the one from my one Lebeer theory equal to the one in the other Lebeer theory, doesn't even make sense unless we have some functor that we can at least talk about, right? Right. Okay, all right, got it. Thank you for taking that aside. Yeah, sure. Um, but something that's actually important is that usually when we're talking about Lebeer theories, there's this additional information where we have we say a Lavier theory is a, a category that has all these finite products so since we have this we have a category with the stipulation for extra structure that structure being it has to have these finite products usually we're interested in just those functors that preserve the finite products meaning that if we have, uh, let's say a category, let's say objects A and B in our one category, we can multiply them in our first category and then apply the functor to it. Or we can apply the functor to each A and B individually and then take the products over here in the new category. And then those two things will be the same. Okay. Um, and so, it, it would follow that if a functor preserved finite products, and if we had a finite product preserving functor between Lavier theories, then that would have to take the object one in our first Lavier theory to the object one in our second Lavier theory. Because one is a product, it's a nullary product. Yeah, got it, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, again, so the nice thing about these products, uh, sorry, like these, these objects X with all of their finite products taken of X, uh, is that we can think of them in certain ways. So in particular, we can think of the object one as a sort of abstraction of the number one in that if we take one times X, that's the same thing as just taking X itself or we can multiply by one on the right-hand side. Right. So I'm being a little bit hand wavy here. Really that equal sign isn't necessary, isn't strictly true because there's a weaker notion of equality in categories called isomorphism. 
So really those should be isomorphisms, but I'm not, I don't really want to get into all that right now. So for now, I'm just going to say it's that they're equal. Just know that there's a sort of asterisk next to me saying that they're equal. Um, okay. So the number one is just an abstraction of the number one that we're used to. Uh, then this X, so it's just an abstract thing, but the way to think of it is as the name of the carrier for the elements that we'll be using. Once we turn this X into uh, a monoid or another sort of algebraic gadget. Um, so for instance, if we're right now, this X is nothing, but we could maybe just turn X via taking a model of the theory we could turn it into the real numbers. And then I don't wanna say how we do that yet, but right now this X is nothing. We, it only becomes something once we start doing things with the Levere theory, which we'll get into later. Um, and then X to the N, again, just means the n-fold product of X's. Okay, so um, because the Levere theory has these finite products, we necessarily have all of these projection maps. So from any n-fold product, we'll have n projection maps down to x. For instance, if n is 2, then we'll have just x times x. And then that'll have two projection maps, one that projects the first factor of x down to x, and another one that projects the second factor of x down to x. And then, of course, if we have n to the third, then we have three projection maps, one that projects the first copy of X down to X, the middle copy of X, and the, the last copy of X, and so on. And this continues all the way up, so that for the n-fold product of X, we actually have n projection maps. Okay, um, so these, so Levere theory necessarily has these maps, right? Every Levere theory has these. It's not part of the definition, uh, but it follows from the definition of Levere theory. Because once we say we have finite products, these maps are necessarily part of the structure. Um, so to actually get a Levere theory to do what we want, uh, we'll add additional arrows to capture the operations that we're actually interested in. So basically the resting state or the most boring Levere theory that you can have is just these objects, one, x, x squared, x cubed, and so on, together with all the projection maps. That's like the most vanilla Levere theory that we can have. Uh, and it doesn't really do anything for us. Uh, but we can add more arrows to Levere theory, and then we'll get something maybe more interesting. And that's what we'll do. So whatever arrows we do add, they'll always interact with these projection maps, or these projection arrows. Um, so let's see what we're, let's try to do an example. Um, so first I'll do it outside of category theory, and then I'll try to turn it into category theory. So algebra, of course, is just all about adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. And I'm putting all those in quotes because I'm not literally talking about adding like one plus one is two. Um, that's an instance of adding, but we can also be adding like matrices or arrays or all kinds of different things, which isn't adding in the sort of sense, the grade school sense. And multiplying two, it isn't necessarily just taking two times two is four, right? You can multiply like matrices together and that's a different sort of multiplication. Um, so, but in algebra, at least for a mathematician, you don't necessarily wanna do all of this all at the same time. Sometimes we only have a thing where we can do one of these. Like we can only add or we can only multiply. And maybe we could actually do more, but we're only interested in a single operation. So we sort of ignore all those. So if we have a set with a bunch of elements with a single one of these sort of operations like adding or multiplying, which are the two basic operations. Uh, then we call this thing a monoid. 
right? So a mongol is just a set with a single binary operation on it. I'll give you a, def a better definition in a second. Um, but here's an example first. So suppose we just have a set consisting of these three letters, A, B, C, and we can develop this language that consists of all the strings in our set, right? So they're just strings with the letters A, B, C's contained in them, right? So arbitrary strings like this. And also the empty word, which is the string which contains no letters at all. So we can multiply these strings by concatenating, right? So if we have a string A, A, B, and we have another string C, B, well, we can multiply these together to get the string A, A, B, C, B, right? So this is what's called a monoid because we should have a set and the single operation, which is like a multiplication. And again, this is sort of illustrative of why I'm putting multiply in quotes, because this isn't multiplication in the sense of two times two is four, right? It's a different sort of thing, but I'm just overloading the word multiply, really, to make it more general. Um, okay, so are there any questions on this slide? Okay. Um, so, a more formal definition of the monoid is it's a set X together with an identity element. So let me go back for a second. Um, so the identity element is a special element in our set. So actually, I probably should have been a little bit more careful here. The set we're considering is not X. It's actually LX, the language of strings. That's really the set that we're interested in here. And then the identity on this language, it would be empty word, right? Because when you concatenate the empty word onto any string, you, you, you keep that string the same, it doesn't change, right? So that's like sort of in the sense that multiplying by one or adding by zero. Concatenating by the empty word is sort of like a similar operation. So that's what the identity element does. And we also have some multiplication. Um, or again, multiplication is abstract here. It's not necessarily multiplying numbers. And we set, we have to also satisfy these two equations, where if we multiply any element by our identity, it's like doing nothing at all, right? So the identity times X for an object, sorry, for an element X in our set is the same element as just X is the same element as X times our identity element. And also we have associativity. So it doesn't matter which order we uh, multiply. If you can multiply, if we have one multiply three things together, you can either multiply the first two or the second two things first, it doesn't matter. Um, so this is a very standard algebraic gadget. And so what we wanna do, uh, sir, sir. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry for cutting you short. Uh, a monoid now is it just um, a set with um, that that has just one binary operation or a multiplication operation? Uh, yes. Which is it? Is it just any binary operations, or it has to be a multiplication operation? Uh, well, multiplication is just a generic word here, so. Uh, I'm sorry. So, I, yeah, I should be more clear. So, it's really just a binary operation. I guess I'm being a little bit flippant in my language. Um, so, I'm using, I guess I was using multiplication to uh, evoke the idea of a binary operation, a multiplication that we learn in high school or grade school or whatever. Um, but really, it's any binary operation. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Thanks All for right, thank allowing me to clear that up. Right, okay. um, so let's see if we can take this monoid definition and reframe it using the idea of a Levere theory. Um, so we want to turn each part of this monoid definition into category theory somehow. So we have these four, we really have these five parts, right? We have the set, we have the identity element, the multiplication, uh, these equations with involving identity and these uh, equations involving 
associativity. All right, so I'm gonna try, try to turn these five things into category theory. So the set X is gonna turn into our generating object. And when I say turn into, I just, it really abstracts to the idea of a generating object is what I mean. So while a set contains actual elements, a generating object doesn't contain anything. Right, so we're abstracting away the fact that a set contains things. And we're really just using the name. And it won't, those elements that are involved in the set that are no longer evolved in our generating object will return later when we start doing things with our library theory. But we're sort of kicking them to the side for now because they're just getting in our way. Um, so the identity element Instead of having an identity element, because we can't talk about elements of a generating object or any object really. So we have to have a new way to talk about elements. And the way that is, is an arrow from one to X. Right, so to capture the idea of an identity element, we're gonna introduce the, this sort of arrow from one to X. And the way to think of it as one is like a single dot. Sorry, actually, maybe we can go back, take this arrow, but de abstract it into the world of sets again. So it's a very specific arrow. So if we think of these as sets for a second, well, the set one is just a set containing a single object. You can think of it like a dot. The set X is whatever set you're interested in. And an arrow is just a set function. So a set, fun a set function just associates every element in your domain to an element in your codomain or your range. So since we only have a single element in our domain, which is one, that means all this is function is really doing is picking out a single object or a single element in X. So that's the way that we'll sort of talk about elements of an object in categories because we can't really talk about elements. We instead talk about maps from this object one into whatever object we're interested in. So in this way, we have a special element of X called E, which is our identity. But we're abstracting this, so this is just an arrow, right? So it's no longer we're picking out a element in X. We're actually we're abstracting all that away, um, but that's like the, the archetypal example that you can have in your mind to try to feel comfortable about this. Um, so that's how we get an identity element. Is there a question? Yeah, I do. So is, um, are you constructing the, the greatest lower bound? Is that what it's called? That you drive all the other elements from that? Um, almost, it's almost a greatest lower bound. Uh, it's, not quite because, well, X, well, there's, well, I guess there's different notions of an order. Um, so there isn't really a best way to order these objects. Um, usually, yeah, so there's, yeah, there's definitely not a best way to order these objects. So I wanna say greatest lower bound, um, but there is a generating object for sure. But it also, this generating object, in a sense, creates things that are less than it because this X also creates, generates this one. And the one in, I guess, more of a psychological sense than a mathematical sense is, can be thought of as less than X. Um, okay, so the identity element turns into this arrow, but also the multiplication or uh, 
another way of saying a multiplication or a better way is the binary operation. This will also be an arrow, which I'll call M from X cross X to X. Right, so these are all things that are very category-ish, right? So we have turn now a monoid, we turn the set into just an object that'll generate a category. We have this identity element, which is now a special arrow. Uh, we, have a, we have this multiplication or binary operation, and this is also an arrow, but we still have these equations that we have to deal with. And so these equations, they turn into what are called commuting diagrams. And so you see this, we have this one equation, EX times X equals X. So what that does is to turn that into categorical language, we have to take, uh, let's look at the left triangle on this. So we have these two arrows. If we start at one times X, these two arrows that we can go down to X with. So we can go to the right and then down, or we can go just straight down to X. So to say that, so this equation is gonna turn into this commutative diagram, meaning that the composition of the arrows that I'm right now calling E times ID and M is the same thing as just going from one times X to X. And I'll explain what those mean. Um, but that's what it means to be a commuting diagram is that the two different paths are the same. They're equal, right? They need not be a priori, but we're uh, stipulating that they must be. And so what does this actual left triangle mean? Okay, so we're starting with the object one times X, which really is the same thing as X. Right, X, as I explained before. So one times X actually equals X. So this arrow that goes from one times X directly to X is the identity arrow, meaning that it does nothing. It's just a, it's just a thing that says it's equal to itself. So that's what that arrow represents. And so saying that this diagram commutes, this left triangle commutes, means that if we do this first arrow, E times ID, and then the arrow M, that's the same thing as doing nothing. Okay, and so again, I'll explain what E times ID and M are in a second, but if you notice the left equation, E times X equals X, well, that equality right there is basically saying like nothing happens when we multiply E times X. So, all right, so what are these other two arrows, E times ID and M? Um, okay, so we have E, and E, remember, is our identity arrow, our identity element. So that is an arrow from one to X that sort of picks out, in a sense, the identity element. And then what's happening next to that so you can think of, so that's happening on the first factor, right? And then on the second factor, this X, well, the ID means is literally the identity arrow. So nothing happens. So what we're doing here is we have an arrow from one times X to X times X. And in the first factor, we're picking out the, our identity objects. And the second factor, we're doing nothing. Okay, so Daniel, I think I just made a big breakthrough. That that arrow, E, how are you pronouncing that? E cross ID? Sure, yeah. Okay, it basically takes this this one cross X that you have and it applies the E arrow to the one and it mm -hmm. applies the ID arrow to the X. Yes. Is that right? Okay, okay, yes. got it. I was missing that before. Beautiful, no, that's, that's good. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like, what's happening here is like that arrow is basically like picking out an identity arrow and, and like some, some element X. There are no elements, but I like, you can think of it in the back of your mind as pick as having elements. Um, so in a way, these are like picking out the two things that we're then going to multiply. So we're not doing anything yet. We're just picking out things. 
Um, in particular, we're picking out the identity object and any other object that we want in X. And then when we go down, the next arrow we have is uh, X cross X down to X. And that M is our multiplication operation or our binary operation. All right, so we don't know what that is because it's abstract, but for instance, it could be just addition of numbers. So what this path is doing, E times ID, followed by M, is saying, all right, pick out two elements. In particular, the first element better be the identity element, and then multiply those two elements together. And what this triangle commuting says that, all right, because if we go down, if we go to the right and then down, because that's like picking out the identity element and any other element and then multiplying them together. And then the arrow going straight down to X is like doing nothing. Well then saying those two things are equal is just saying that picking out the identity element and then any other element and multiplying them together is exactly the same as doing nothing, right? Which is an abstract way of encoding, of saying that E times X is equal to X for any element X. And then because we also have the other triangle says the same exact information, except it has us multiplying our identity element on the right side instead of the left. So it's just, it's just symmetric. Um, are there any uh, questions on that one? I guess I'm still struggling with the, with the E arrow a little bit. I get that it goes from the null area product from this one. I don't really get what it goes to. What is that X? Is it a specific X that's the same every time? Or I don't, I'm not quite sure what that means. I'm not, I guess I'm a little confused what, when you have X times X that just gives us X. Is that true for arbitrary X's or when it's the same X or? Um, so these are all the same X. Um, okay. but the X can be anything. So, so remember if we go back, um, we started with the, the idea, the definition of a monoid. Mm -hmm. And so we're still changing the definition of a monoid into category theory. That's mm -hmm. where we're at right now. Yep. Um, and so a monoid consists of a set together with yeah. all of this stuff. So for instance, we had the set, uh, hold on, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, it's, it's getting to the point where I have to get going actually. That's cool. It's noon. Should we wrap it here? You think? Yeah. Cause I have, yeah, I have actually another call I have to get on to. Sorry. Yeah, we've gone actually three minutes over. That's, that's, cool. um, I should have. Um, but I can pick up this again next time for sure. If that sounds awesome. Thanks a lot, Kevin and, and Daniel for stepping up while Jake wasn't around today. I learned anytime, a lot. Anytime. And thank you, Daniel. That was a great yeah, presentation. Thanks. Yeah, hopefully we can get uh, more done next time. Sorry I had to cut it off early. All right. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, yeah, Daniel. Uh, I know, that's why you didn't. Eh?